Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Hello, friend, and welcome back. Welcome. I'm so happy that you're here, and I'm so appreciative of your listening here. And in this episode, we're going to investigate ego, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, as I talk more about the ego, I'm going to reserve the good portion or the good, pres- <laughs> the good aspects of ego for the end. So we're going to talk about the bad aspects first, some of the ugly aspects of ego, and we'll end up talking about how the ego actually serves you. Well, if you're listening to the aligned self, then I know that you're invested in personal growth. You're um, a seeker. You're questioning, you know, the spiritual aspects of life. And you've probably heard at one point or another that one of the spiritual uh, goals is to kill the ego, to experience the ego death. It's generally thought that the ego, the self, the identification with, you know, your personality gets in the way of you truly knowing God, of truly having a relationship with the divine. Well, hold that thought, and we'll come full circle around this near the end of the podcast. So let's start out, what is ego? Ego is Latin for I. It is representative of the self, the self-concept, self-image, self-identity, your personality, that aspect of you that you consider the I am, the part that is separate, you know, that is contained within your spin, your skin bag, that has a life, that has relationships, that is your ego. Now, in an episode real soon, I'll be talking about who are you, the source of your self-identity, and we'll dive deeper into how that's formed. But for today's discussion, let's just consider ego to be that aspect that you consider uh, you. And then to really get the understanding of where the ego is coming from, I think we need to understand what is the ego after? What is the one thing that we basically, as all human beings, seek to know? It's to be validated that we exist, that we're important, that we're valuable, that we're, we're somebody, that our existence has meaning. So then as a consequence, if we have a bad, quote unquote, relationship with our ego, then we are in constant search of validation. In our relationships, we seek the other person to accept us, to love us, to acknowledge us. In the marketplace, you know, it's all about the position, the job, the the money, the car, the status, because all that stuff in some way, we think, means something about how great we are, how valuable we are. You can see it on social media, on Instagram and Facebook, you know, when there's an inordinate number of selfies and look at me and where the success of a post is how many likes it gets, how many people, you know, give you the thumbs up. It could be the part of you that won't leave the house without makeup or that always has to have their hair, you know, styled. When I was younger in my 30s, I began losing my hair uh, rapidly, and so was my, and so did my best friend. Now, I embraced it. I, you know, I don't know if, I think I have a pretty good looking bald head, so I shaved it. I just cut it off rather than bother with it. And uh, my friend at the time invested $3,000 for a hair treatment and then invested that $3,000 every year for the next five years in an effort to save his hair. Now, he has a pretty good head of hair today. Uh, he has the friar tuck going on in the back, but uh, we won't tell him that because I don't think he can see it in the mirror. But this this whole thing about hair uh, is indicative of how we identify, you know, aspects of who we are with external, uh, seemingly insignificant aspects of us. You know, it's we use our hair and our hairstyle to portray or identify who we are. And I know for a woman that has ever had to go through chemo and they lose their hair, it can be somewhat devastating. I have a friend of mine whose friend uh, once upon a time was diagnosed with breast cancer. And as a statement of solidarity and to support her friend who was losing her hair, she shaved her head and she had a beautiful head of hair. But in doing that for her friend, I thought it expressed uh, a certain amount of selflessness. 
So here's a self-check. Would you, could you cut your hair? Cut it all off. Cut it really, really short. Drastically short. Now, I admit, if you are follically challenged like I am, then uh, it's not that big a deal because you probably accept it on some level. But uh, if you are proud of your hair, just ask yourself the question, could you cut it all off? How much do you identify who you are with your hairstyle or with the amount of hair that you have? Now, this is typically a vice of the younger set, but, uh, you know, even if you're older in your 40s or 50s or 60s, you know, you reach a point where you're less, uh, I guess, less, less encumbered, less concerned with uh, the perspective that other people have of you. Then you realize that uh, your life well lived is not done so in the fulfillment and maintaining other people's expectations of you. So this points to what is bad about a, an ill-formed ego. It is that there is a constant need and want to validate yourself externally through other people's opinions, other people's uh, admiration, awards, money, prestige. All that means a lot. And your entire life is driven to have that acknowledgement, to, driven to have your ego stroked and fulfilled. You will go out of your way to look good to other people. You will withhold your opinion. You may uh, lie in order to look good and not put yourself in a position to be disliked. You experience yourself uh, having a certain amount of a duplicity where you say one thing and do another. You may over-dramatize uh, events or a story um, in order to look good or have it be more entertaining. Actually <laughs> fabricate aspects of the story. Or you may even uh, uh, make yourself look bad, make the situation look worse than it is, so you get some attention, you get some sympathy. You see, an ill-formed ego doesn't generate energy on its own. It's in a constant struggle to obtain energy, attention from outside. So why is this so bad? Well, your life is not your own. You actually sell aspects of your persona, aspects of your ideals in order to fit in, in order to be accepted by other people. It is a constant dance of projecting out to other people who, you th what, who and what you think they want to see, as opposed to being, truly being yourself. And you can do that for a certain amount of time, and then it feels like, I just got to get away. I just, like, just got to get off by myself. You feel the persona, you feel the armor about to crack. And that if you reveal who you really are, what's really inside, then all those around you just might not like you. And then there's a fear of being rejected. So if that's the bad, what's the ugly? Well, the ugly shows up as two personality syndromes. One is the sociopath who doesn't care at all what you think. They're going to do what they want to do, uh, but they have zero empathy. They can't even begin to imagine what life might be like for you. They are the people that walk all over other people and situations and don't care who they hurt. They have the idea that if you get in their way, that's your tough luck. Now, it might seem as if their ego is pretty much intact, but the truth is, the truth is that it is very weak and they have to create that defense mechanism in order to not feel anything, to not acknowledge just how they feel about themselves. And the other aspect is narcissist. And now there is not really a narcissist. There are people that display and live with narcissistic tendencies and the behaviors occur in a wide spectrum. But again, the source of it is not an overdeveloped ego. It is an underdeveloped ego or sense of self. Now, I will do another episode with a deeper dive into narcissism because it's so pervasive in culture and in, it's coming into light in popular psychology even more so than it has in the last few years. And if you identify yourself as empath or a psychic, more than likely you will attract that type of individual because they know that they can manipulate your sympathy. They can draw your energy out of you. And you're left feeling depleted or less than. 
drained. Now, this is something different than an energy vampire, although uh, leaving an exchange with a narcissist who can feel like you've had the life sucked out of you. Now, this isn't all the time because they can be very magnanimous, very charismatic, you know, as they're putting their best foot forward because they want people to like them. Publicly, they'll do acts of generosity. They'll go, you know, they want you to see them as someone that's going over and above. And they also often embellish their stories in order to look better than they are. They'll even change some of the facts. So there's, there's many, many similarities to the, the bad, quote-unquote, uh, ego. But these are a lot more sinister. Because if you challenge them, if you challenge one of their stories, or you call them out on you know, a promise that they broke, or perhaps a lie that they told, then suddenly... It's something like, me? What about me? What about you? And then they start tearing you down and making you think like you're totally stupid for even bringing it up, that you have no right, that that you have no right to judge them. Who do you think you are? And they'll systematically try to gaslight you to think, you know, so where you think you're crazy for even bringing it up. They'll try and shift the blame making you look bad, making you look like you're the one that needs to be reviewed here. And they'll systematically try to tear down your character and take your head and try and rub it in the shame on the floor. And of course, if you have any kind of relationship with you, you have this compulsion to want to defend yourself because you understand that the characterization that they've just made of you is so far off that they must not be saying things right. So you want to try and explain it which typically just makes things worse. And then they'll beat you down again emotionally until you stay down. Now, I'm taking a leap of faith here that you're not the narcissist, that you may deal with one or have dealt with one. So if you've been on the receiving end of the emotional abuse and sometimes physical abuse of a narcissist, it was never about you. It was about them protecting their fragile ego. And they did it with anger, blame and the only way they knew how and that was to tear you down so they could feel and walk away a little bit better so if you happen to be in a relationship with a person like this and are not quite sure whether or not they are a narcissist or are displaying narcissistic tendencies so here's a point for you to check in with when they're out in public uh, they're usually magnanimous and charismatic and other people are going to tell you or you know, confirm, you know, they're just amazing. I just love them. They're just so much fun and fun to be around. And it just kind of makes you sick inside because you know, it's all a mask. You know how they are behind closed doors and it ain't pretty when nobody's looking and they can let down their mask and let Mr. Hyde or Mrs. Hyde out of the closet. Now, the sad part of it is that Uh, narcissists rarely heal because they're just not willing to be vulnerable and lower their defenses enough to really look at the damage that they cause in the relationships. If they go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist because they know they have issues, they end up quitting because frankly, it's just too hard and embarrassing to actually deal with it. And they'll project onto the psychiatrist or the counselor and say, they're stupid, they're idiot, they don't know what they're doing. And I'm not going to waste my money with that idiot. Now, again, if you're in relationship with someone with narcissistic tendencies, uh, sometimes there's a, um, let's see, a compulsion on your part to explain that they are the way they are because they had a horrendous childhood. They definitely had trauma in their past. And while that's true, and it may pacify you for a while to kind of tolerate the behavior, there is a point in time where you just need to do um, what needs to be done, and that's to leave. Because like I said, unless they're really invested in changing, they're not going to change. So for me personally, uh, on four different occasions, I've had to break up with a friend. As long as things were light, as long as we were amicable and getting along, and there wasn't anything too serious or too intimate going on, then, you know, we were fine. You know, they're usually charming, they're funny, they do things for you, they buy you gifts unexpectedly because, what, they want to look good. 
And, you know, when they do it, it seems like they're really doing it for you. But in each of those relationships, it came down to a point where they made a commitment, they made a promise, and they didn't keep it. When I acknowledged it, Mr. or Mrs. Hyde, hiding inside, rears its ugly head and just lets me have it. And I can admit the first couple of times I was, uh, <laughs> I tried to defend myself. I said, hey, wait a minute, you're getting this all wrong. But I finally had to cut things off. To the point now when it happens in my life, I've dealt with it, you know, in my life, and I've dealt with it through clients, you know, partners that they've had, and and I'm attempting to, I guess, restore the self-esteem or the damage that's been done. Um, what used to be red flags to me are now deal breakers. How they're being in that moment when they're attempting to shift blame and gaslight, it is so absurd to me. It's almost funny. But there will be that dynamic when their response seems so absurd, so out of proportion to the dynamic of what's going on, that you can say with confidence, it's not you, it's them. Well, I changed my mind. Earlier in the episode, I said something about, you know, taking a deep dive in narcissism. And frankly, I said more here than I wanted to say. So that's all I'm going to say at least for the near term. Uh, now, if you want to dive deeper into this, if you want to explore uh, more about this, if it's something you're dealing with or something you need to heal from, uh, search out Dr. Ramini, R-A-M-A-N-I, on YouTube. She is probably one of the most articulate voices in uh, uh, quite the expert on narcissism, more so than probably... 95% of the psychologists out there, because frankly, it's been considered a syndrome for so long that just a personality defect, and it is pervasive. It's pervasive in politics. It's, in perva it's pervasive in leadership. My friend Matt Kramer wrote a book of predatory leadership and how we support, promote, and vote for these narcissists, and then we wonder why things are all screwed up. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to leave a, a, a link in the show notes for Dr. Ramini on how to find her on, on YouTube. And I'll post a link to Matt Kramer's book. It's like a 99 cent Kindle. Okay, so that was the ugly. And you know, if you've ever had to deal with it, it is ugly. Before I leave you with that, um, I do want to say that it is sourced typically from trauma, uh, from a fragile self-esteem. It's not that they are overly uh, egocentric, even though it may show up that way as an alpha male or an aggressive personality. Um, it really comes from weakness, trying to cover up the weakness and how they feel about themselves. So have compassion for them, but you do not have to die for them. You do not have to sacrifice your well-being so that they can exist in the world. And of the friends that I've parted ways with, I want them to be happy. I want them to have the best life possible for them. But I'm not going to be the one that is their doormat. And if I was to hang around and make excuses for them and rationalizations on why they are the way they are, it would just perpetuate the behavior. So, you may be wondering, at this point, is there anything good about the ego? Well, there is. When your ego is well-formed, when you have a well-formed self-concept, then you are not used by your ego in order to get validated outside, but you use the ego in order to fulfill on a mission to be self-expressed. Because remember, we are a spiritual being immersed in the human experience. So we actually need our ego, our sense of identity, in order to create in the world. And that's, you know, I think that's the meaning of life to be in the process and realize that we are a creator. We create our reality through our thoughts. I believe that so much that you can create who you are for the world that I teach it in the Align Self program. I've actually centered my life around the concept. But unfortunately, most people don't choose who they are in the world. It's more of a default program that's been handed to them validated through parents and peers and, and other people in authority. So when you have a healthy uh, relationship with your ego, you understand that you are not your ego. You are not your persona. 
It is just a tool that you use to navigate in the world. You see, for me to even be on this podcast, I need to rely on my ego to get behind the microphone so that I have a sense or a feeling like I have something worthwhile to say. But I do this not to have everyone tell me how wonderful I am, because not that many people do, (laughs) but uh, it's in order to educate, because I know that there were times in my life when I had questions. There were times in my life when I was curious about what's next, what's possible, and it was another teacher. I stand on the shoulders of other people that have taught me. I'm not saying anything new under the sun, but I'm saying it in my way. It's on my own self-expression. But again, I don't need to have a lot of likes, a lot of followers, but I would like a lot of students because that pays the bills. So through the podcast, I naturally attract clients. It's not the thrust of what I'm doing because every podcast has value. It's a standalone walk away, you know, teaching or lesson. But I would be lying if I didn't say that I hope that, you know, of the thousands of people that listen, that one or two of you uh, are more than welcome to take part in my $5,000, $10,000, or $50,000 coaching program. You know, that helps pay the bills. It feeds the family. And while I'm here to make a difference, I'm also here to fulfill on a livelihood. But clients aside, what really feeds me is that you get an aha experience that you receive some knowledge where you feel a little bit lighter, that you have greater possibility in your life. And some of you have written me and said, you know, these episodes have changed your life. A couple of you said they've saved your life. And those statements are very humbling to me. I have no idea. Sometimes I just sit down and talk. And like Christ said, I am not the drink. I am the chalice. And so I am the vehicle You know, the knowledge is coming through me. It's come through other teachers. And so it's really not about me in the end. It's about you. So someone with a healthy ego, a good ego, uh, will talk about us and we, and not so much about I. Take the Dalai Lama, for instance, one of the premier spiritual teachers on the planet. Somebody asked him how he would describe himself, and he replied, I'm just a simple monk. A master will never claim themselves to be a master. They always say that they're a student because they always see that they have so much to learn. A true shaman never calls themselves a shaman. They might say mystic or spiritual teacher or holy man, but they don't say shaman. Now that's for other people to say. That's for other people to point to. So as I said before, we are a spiritual being immersed in the human experience and we require the ego in order to fulfill on that human uh, process, that human journey is part of our journey. There is an essential need for a human being to have that autonomy, to be in the tribe, in the universe, one with all, and also have a sense of self, a sense of identity. If you look at the great prophets and Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad, even Gandhi. There is that ego present in that I have something to do. I have something to transmit, but there is a disidentification with it that they know that, and you know that your ego is not all that you are. Now, sometimes this acknowledgement, this knowing comes from having a transpersonal experience where you perhaps leave your body for one reason and have a transcendental experience. It could be the result of psychedelics, drugs, or you could have had a near-death experience where you died and you left your body. And this points to one of the problems with having a near-death experience that once you go back to your body, it's like nothing seems the same. Because dude, you just left your body. Your consciousness left the building. And so you have this profound knowing that's so difficult to explain to somebody else that, hey, that persona, that skin bag, that's not me. You know yourself as the field of pure potential. I had a transpersonal experience when I was 28. Before that, I would say, I am Daniel. I'm a man. I'm even a Michigander. I'm a mix of French, Polish, Irish, and Asian, and I'm a Scorpio. After my experience, I say things like, My name is Daniel. I happen to be a man. I'm playing as a human this time around. My heritage, I'm a mutt. (laughs) 
<laughs> There's a little bit of everything in me. A couple years ago, my wife did one of those uh, genetic tests and uh, tried to find out things about me <laughs> that she didn't know, that she didn't already know. And it, it turns out that I have uh, a high percentage of ne Neanderthal uh, in me and a genome shared with King Louis the Fourteenth. So I'm royalty. I'm a royal caveman. You see, all that stuff is just useful or not useful. It's interesting information, but it's not that useful. It doesn't define me. It doesn't define who I am. You know, I'm not a Scorpio. I happen to be a Scorpio. It's one of the influences on me. You see, the, the ego death, the death of the ego is realizing that all that stuff, all that persona, all the self-identity is just an idea. It's not who you really are. And there's no need to seek validation from outside sources for something that's imaginary, illusory. Just so I don't mislead you now, um, I've done a lot of work on myself and some of that uh, wasn't even my doing. You know, when I left my body, that was a gift. There was some pre-paving on my part that happened before that, uh, but evidently I was ready. But even so, I am far from perfect. I have and can say that uh, I've made just about every mistake that a person could make uh, while traveling on the planet. I've not been that magnanimous in many cases. And I have some periods in my past that I can look back on and I'm a little ashamed that I did that or went through that. Uh, but I can admit it. There's nothing that I can't admit that I've done because frankly, those events, those uh, periods did not define me, even though they did inform uh, better choices today and in the future. And while I can't imagine being completely devoid of ego, um, my ego does not drive me. Well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> well, anyways, if you find yourself in the category of uh, having a bad relationship with your ego, uh, good news is that we're going to have several uh, episodes coming up that are going to talk about uh, validating yourself from the inside out, rewriting your story, and developing a, a rock-solid self-image. So if you, this is your first time with the Align Self Podcast, subscribe so you can uh, be notified of the future episodes. And if you haven't yet done so, uh, please join us in our Facebook group, the Align Self Podcast Listeners Facebook group. And again, the link is in the show notes. And there you can let me know what you thought about the episode. If you have any more questions, if you have any more insights, maybe something I didn't discuss that I should discuss, you can connect with me and others in the Facebook group. This is Daniel Danovi suggesting you follow your bliss and live the epic life.